So welcome everyone. My name is Davide De Biasio and I'm a member of the ISQG Outreach Activity Team. Today I'll have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Bianca Dietrich. She's a faculty member at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Canada. And she made quite a lot of contributions to the field of quantum gravity, loop quantum gravity, and spin foam models in particular. Dr. Dietrich, it is a great pleasure for me to interview you today. Thank you very much for being here. I'm happy to be invited. Thank you. That's great. So let me start by maybe asking you to tell us something about your research interests in general. What have you been working on in these years? So I've always been interested in um, you know, fundamental physics and uh, as part of that, uh, quantum gravity is one of the more fundamental questions in, in physics. Um, and um, I've been drawn to what people call usually um, non-perturbative approaches to quantum gravity. So that's where you try to be very brave and quantize uh, space-time um, directly. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, luckily I could keep doing that over the years. So I'm still, I'm still at it. <laughs> well, I think at this point it's quite natural to start from the very beginning, right? And maybe ask you why do we need a theory of quantum gravity in the first place? Because that's a natural question that might arise. Why do we need it? So, well, as as we know, we we do have um, very successful um, quantum theories for three of the fundamental interactions. Basically, what we usually call the, the matter sector. Um, but gravity is kind of a special force, uh, in, in that basically we know that it's encoded in the properties of, of, of space time. Uh, if you try to couple matter with gravity, there's a bit long discussions, it does not seem to happen consistently if you do not quantize gravity. So that's one side. Um, and then we do see that gravity and actually space-time have really lots of dynamical properties. So they are not like in the old times something which you cannot change, but you have kind of time dilation effects. You know, space is, is curved and changing, but even, even time, which we usually say is something which does not, which is just there, is itself a very dynamical thing. And so far, everything dynamical, which is more fundamental, well, on a more fundamental level, seems to be quantized. Additionally, there are all kinds of hopes connected to quantum gravity to resolve mm -hmm. a number of unsolved questions, um, both in quantum field theory and in classical gravity. So in quantum field theory, it's basically um, Infinities, which which occur if you go to high energies, and and classical gravity, it's basically black hole singularities, or to answer what happens at the beginning of space and time of at the beginning of the universe or the Big Bang singularity. So, well, you mentioned quite a few reasons. If I may sum them up, we might say that on one hand we have open problems within gravity itself singularities, black holes, the origin of the universe, and we need to make a description of gravity consistent with the other quantum field theories, right, being it dynamically. Would you agree with the synthesis? Um, yes, and then it's basically also to, to have a consistent theory of quantum field theory itself. Oh, so yeah. we have, we have uh, a one basically young mill theory or quantum chromodynamics, which you can define without gravity. <laughs> um, but then the other leads lead to, to infinities. Well, and focusing, because it would be really interesting to go along this line and talking a bit about quantum field theories, but uh, doing a bit of a step back, since we mentioned quantum mm -hmm. gravity quite a few times, uh, may I ask you what are some general expectations uh, 
before going into more technical topics about uh, quantum gravity, this quantum space-time, as you said, the gravity in the end is mm -hmm. a definition of space-time. So uh, what, what do you expect from quantum gravity in a very general and uh, straightforward sense? So as I, as I mentioned, gravity is, is quite special compared to other quantum field uh, uh, meta, meta field theories. And um, well, it's because according, according to Einstein, gravity is really a property of space-time. So it's how space-time is curved and how space-time behaves. Um, and it, uh, it comes with this also huge group of symmetries. Um, you can understand them as coordinate transformations or diffeomorphisms, which uh, we don't have so much uh, experience with in some sense. So actually even this to, to write down quantum field theories, which are um, covariant with respect to all kinds of coordinate transformations. It's highly non-trivial because you get already, you know, and basically very non-trivial effects if you if you think of the unruh effect and these things. So it's and it's not very much explored. Um, but then uh, gravity is indeed the idea that we quantize gravity and visit actually space time. And the technical difficulty, if you want, is to do that um, covariant with respect to coordinate transformations um, and diffeomorphisms. Um, so for one, it does require quite new techniques or quite, we expect that it's a different framework. Uh, and uh, the other reason, indeed, because we have, we want to have covariance uh, with respect to coordinate transformations. Basically all um, observables we are so much used to in quantum field theory, we cannot use them. So, um, you know, so, like the main observables in quantum field theory, you can you can say uh, are correlation functions or fields fields at a point, you know. So correlation, and you you talk about oh how do correlation functions decay over distance? You know, it's a, it's a key observable in quantum field theory or something or key to compute and to classify quantum field theories and also statistical systems and everything. But these kind of questions do not make sense in quantum gravity. So we do not have the notion of, oh, this is a space-time point. And this is something which is really fundamental. So um, if you want to construct observables which do not depend on your choice of coordinates, one way to do that is to use what, what is called relational observables. And basically that means well, if you we, if you refer to some you know space-time point or space-time region in the end, you always have to specify that with, with respect to some clock you are using or some measurement, how do you specify space? You know, so you can do that by using, for instance, well, other meta fields mm -hmm. or geometric measurements in some sense, you know, so something. So you you would have to construct, reconstruct your notion of space time using only really physical measurements. You cannot refer to any kind of space time background because that's what you want to quantize. That is what is dynamical. Um, and so then indeed, what are expectations? There's, there are very nice arguments which, which you know, uh, don't have much input and sometimes lead to lots of uh, interesting ideas in, in different directions, that basically space-time points do not exist anymore. And um, you cannot refer them to, to them anymore. And so that you, for instance, do have um, a fundamental bound on resolution on your measurements. So you cannot measure any more uh, kind of your meta field to infinite resolution. So um, that, that you cannot resolve them if they are kind of very nearby at nearby points. 
Um, so you have some kind of additional uncertainty. So that are some expectations. And um, well, then are these things to which we might come later. It's kind of, well, if you have quantum space time, you should have also some observables which are kind of geometrical and they might be quantized, for instance. Um, you know, well, so it's kind of uh, that many people put that in as as an idea that maybe quantum space time is discrete, but it would be also nice if it comes out. So, well, um, let me, if I may, first of all, thank you very much for this comprehensive answer. Let me just uh, pack it uh, once more, repack mm -hmm. it in, in chunks, if I may. So the first, uh, you said that the first big uh, complicated problem to solve is that uh, our classical theory of gravity, general relativity, classical in the sense of non-quantum, as this huge symmetry group, namely diffeomorphisms, right, that allow you to move points into the others and uh, shuffle yep. them and so on and so forth, up to, up to some assumptions. Uh, and being that asymmetry, being those symmetries, uh, you do should not really carry some kind of notion of point by itself to your quantum theory, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in a sense, you should be able to express your physical observables only referring to physical entities. Uh, for instance, mm -hmm. this. Uh, let, let me make an example. If, if, let, let's see if I understood correctly. If, for instance, you have a pendulum, right, that oscillates mm -hmm. in a flexible setting, and you want to discuss its angle. You should not express mm -hmm. it as a function of some uh, abstract uh, time variable, but you should really correlate it to some kind of uh, clock you're using and compare the two readings and quantities and not some abstract notion of time, right? Something like that, something along Yeah, this. so if you have a, pen a pendulum, yeah, uh, you know, you could use actually two pen pendili, I guess. <laughs> and uh, see how, how the relative phase changes. Mm -hmm. uh, because well, typically a clock might be also just a, a pendulum. So, um, and that's a discussion you want to do. Um, and you cannot assume that there's some background time. But this is, this is quite, let me just stress this for the people listening to this interview. Like this is quite groundbreaking because since high school, we are used to express physical quantities, positions, velocities as functions of time, um, in some other instances in field theory of space and so on and so forth. And now you're telling us that these variables were used to use are in some sense non-physical in quantum gravity. And we should substitute them with physical quantities you can really observe in an operative way. Is this the upshot, the philosophy behind this? Yeah, this is this is a philosophy, you know, and then indeed um, you can play a bit these games or the expectation games and I think the all, oldest source about that I, I read was actually a, a nice book by by Hermann Bondi, is that if you if you have to restrict to physical systems, you know they might never be perfect. So indeed he had a discussion. You know what is a perfect clock? At some point it will always break. You know? <laughs> and then you can go backwards and say, okay, what what is the meaning of time if you cannot measure it? So maybe you know it does not exist. So. If you cannot measure very small distances or cannot resolve very small distances, you know, do we need to worry what happens at very small distances in some sense? So it's kind of it makes sense uh, to ask it if you cannot measure it, right? That's more or less the yeah, point. So so you can and and these arguments um well, the nice point about it is that you can um you, you can argue for these effects already uh, on the level. On a classical level, actually, um, well, it's commutator relations, so it's classical mechanics. But then you know that you know it goes into quantum quantization, and uh, just the fact that you need these to use these relational observables, so that you need always physical systems <laughs> to construct your notion of time and and space. And following this line, things get extremely weird quite fast, right? Because even clocks, right, are not classical objects, strictly speaking. They're yeah, fine. yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Usually, you know, I mean, the, the the most fundamental, the fastest clock we we use are all kind of 
atoms or I would say or then oscillations. You know, so. This is not only speculative, this is an actual practical thing you're right bringing down to earth. But yeah. wait, a, a few questions ago, uh, you mentioned, briefly mentioned the fact that there are different ways to try to tackle the problem of uh, quantum gravity, but among them, uh, today I'd like to ask you something in particular about the so-called canonical approach to quantum gravity. Would you mind uh, outlining for us its main features, results, techniques, uh, and ideas? So basically, um, the quantum theory, as it was, uh, uh, as it's done canonically, usually means that, that you do have a system and uh, uh, you have observables, classical observables, and so on. And then there's a procedure which is called quantization. <laughs> and basically, um, this procedure is usually called to, to reach, to construct the quantum system um, and also its dynamics. Um, and this uh, well, this quantization comes with a with a number of rules, um, and usually they lead to to interesting effects. In the um, canonical, in in the context of uh, gravity, also usually means that well, you try to split your system. Uh, which is kind of space time into space and time. And also we just say space time, you know, is dynamical and so on. So indeed, you do get lots of interesting technical features if you do that in the case in the case of gravity. And again, you see in this kind of canonical analysis, that gravity is very special. So um things we we um are used to in quantum field theory present are presented differently in, in quantum gravity. So um, one example is that in quantum field theory or also in condensed matter, the dynamics is usually encoded in, in a Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian gives you energy. I mean, it tells you what, what is the energy of the system. Um, and you use this Hamiltonian to time evolve your system. Whereas in canonical quantum gravity, indeed you have a Hamiltonian, but it turns out that, well, this Hamiltonian has, has to be zero. Um, so it is actually a so-called constraint, it's a condition on our quantum, quantum states. And well, then it looks a bit mysterious because if it's zero, what is the time evolution? But then again, you can reconstruct a relational time evolution um, if you do it carefully. Um, so again, you see you see these notions of uh, space and time, which you have to reconstruct from from your theory. Um, and this, well, the second part is really a more technical issue to turn your classical observables. Um, in case of gravity, this would be metric or functions of the metric or things you can reconstruct your metric from mm -hmm. into operators. And once you have these operators, we can speak of uh, well, you know, what kind of spectra do they have? So what kind of measurement outcomes do they allow? And so typically the differenti differentiation we, we do make, do they have continuous spectra? Do they have discrete spectra? And so well, that's how discreteness can come out. Let's see if I understood your point correctly. In a sense, you told me that in order to apply this canonical quantum mechanics approach, like canonical quantization, we usually need to split time and space, or at least have time as a single doubt quantity mm -hmm. that gives us a time evolution. But in doing this, within the context of gravity, things are a bit more technically involved because we know that time is not really something you can single out from space-time without being careful about it because space-time is a dynamical entity by itself. And you need to do so in a way that preserves or respects this kind of diffeomorphism, symmetries, and these things we mentioned before. And in doing this, 
instead of finding the usual Schrodinger-like uh, evolu time evolution in which you have this Hamiltonian, which is nothing more than mm -hmm. an object giving you the energy or somehow generating, forcing and giving you this time evolution, you find a constraint equation. You find something mm -hmm. Hamiltonian uh, acting on your state, whatever, is equal to zero instead of being yeah. a trivial thing. It's somehow trivial. Uh, it's not what you would expect from uh, another theory. Mm -hmm. That is this timelessness uh, you get in quantum gravity. Um, yeah. It's more or, less, yeah. more or less correct. Yeah, okay. yeah indeed. And then you moved on to observables, right? In this sense, you, uh, you naturally mentioned that all your spatio-temporal quantities uh, uh, must be turned into quantum observables, into operators. Mm -hmm stuff that behaves as quantum mechanics tells us it should behave. And you mentioned the fact that some observables might be discrete, right? Might mm -hmm. only take some specific values when we perform a measurement, right? Like mm -hmm. a particle in a box and stuff like that. May I ask you which geometrical or spatiotemporal or gravi gravitational observables are expected to display a discrete spectrum because yeah a continuum spectrum is more uh, consistent with our classical intuition but what about a discrete mm -hmm. one can you make some examples it's, so um so yes um so if you if you go back to uh, standard quantum mechanics then um, you expect you expect an observable to have a discrete spectrum if the conjugated observable generates compact orbits, <laughs> so okay. that sounds a bit complicated. But um, an easy example is just if you do have a configuration variable, which is an angle, then the conjugated observable uh, you expect it to have discrete spectrum. So for for the harmonic oscillator, it's the phase, which is compact. Uh, or for the pendulum, you know, and then the energy uh, is discretized. Um, or you have angular momentum, which is discrete, uh, because the configurations, the conjugated observable basically is is, uh, is a rotation group, and that is compact. Um, so what you what you would expect, um, so if you where we, we might come later to that, but um, if you do um, look into into gravity, uh, you would be interested in uh, quantizing the matrix. Um, but then you do the space the space time decomposition. Um, so you kind of. Uh, decompose your matrix information of your four-dimensional space-time uh, into information of your three-dimensional slices embedded in this four-dimensional space-time. You make cuts, and, right? You yeah, cut you cut. Um, and then this four-dimensional matrix is basically this information about the having the four-dimensional uh, four dimensional matrix everywhere is split into the three-dimensional matrix, so just the intrinsic, so-called intrinsic matrix of these hypersurfaces. And then how these hypersurfaces are embedded. And typically that's what we call extrinsic curvature. So it's how, how the three-dimensional matrix sits in the four-dimensional space. The three-dimensional surfaces sit in the, in the four-dimensional um, space-time. Um, and there's a, this extrinsic curvature. Also, you can locally can kind of a bit understand it in detail as angles. You know how space time, how the spatial surface bends mm -hmm. inside your four dimensional space time. Um, and if you understand it as angles, in principle, it's kind of you can understand them as boosts mm -hmm. that you change a bit your from one hypersurface to 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 the to the, to the other. And so um, it turns out basically uh, that also this kind of embedding information is more or less uh, the momenta and the three-dimensional matrix are uh, the conjugated observables. So um, 
if you now go to a time like hypersurface, not a space like anymore, <laughs> to a time like one, then the booths are actually replaced by rotations. And so we have rotation angles there. So um, the easy part to understand is that you would expect that you get discreteness for quantities, geometric quantities, or um, which measure time-like geometric quantities. And in fact, that's the easy part to argue. And four dimensions, it turns out that time-like areas are discrete and well, at least in loop quantum gravity. <laughs> um, and also in three dimensional space time, it would be actually time like lengths are discrete. Um, so these, this, these are the things you can, you can easily argue for. Um, but then it also turns out that in four dimension loop quantum gravity, the spatial areas are discrete. And that is something which comes in through, uh, through well, in principle, through introducing the so-called Barbero-Mesit parameter. So it's it's a term and the action you add. But we can, I, I guess we should we should come to that a bit later. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Well, thank you first of all for this uh, for this argument. Just to uh, sum it up, in a sense, the kind of uh, a splitting or slicing process you uh, you described at the beginning uh, goes, if I understood correctly, uh, as follows. A 4D object uh, can be constructed by gluing together a lot of 3D objects, in a sense. Spatial, mm -hmm. more or less, objects can be glued in order to construct a 4D space time. And all your geometric information, um, which should be four-dimensional in the beginning, can be decomposed into three-dimensional geometries on the slices, plus, because uh, you need more information, information mm -hmm. on how you glue these slices together in constructing yeah. four-dimensional space. And can this be an, in, a useful intuitive picture for our listeners? Yeah. yeah. OK. And starting from there, you develop your quantum theory of these uh, variables concerning mm -hmm. geometry and your uh, gluings, right? Your <laughs> freedom in gluing them in different ways, which is dynamical and so on and so forth. And you uh, get as a result this uh, discretization of time like areas. Uh, and then you argue that within the context of loop quantum gravity, uh, mm -hmm. you also have some kind of discretization of uh, space time areas, like literal areas, like the area of the table I'm, uh, I'm putting this computer on or this. Yeah, yeah. The vision behind me, and now I cannot avoid asking you, like, what about this result? Like, <laughs> you mentioned it, so uh, I I really can't stop myself from asking you, where does it come from? And if you need to introduce some loop quantum gravity in order to do this before moving to spin forms and and so on, uh, can you tell us something about this? Yeah. So. Um... So indeed, I mentioned that, that if you do this canonical decomposition, yeah, we, we had a three-dimensional matrix and these extreme curvature, or how you how do you glue these three-dimensional things together? And um and then people try to to quantize these objects and to well, construct basically what is called a Hilbert space representation. So a Hilbert space, which would carry a representation of these operators on it. Um, and that turned out to be uh, well, very difficult in the sense that nobody ever managed to do that in a rigorous way. Um, and, and one reason is that, for instance, if you have the three-dimensional matrix, well, this is also su supposed to be um, positive definite, hmm. meaning, for instance, the eigenvalue should be, you know, posit all positive. It, it should be spatial, uh, not spatial temporal. So spatial yeah. matrix. We, we speak, we're speaking about the spatial matrix. And restricting uh, restricting to, to this condition, for instance, is highly non-trivial. It gives you a configuration space, which is which has, you know, boundaries and so on. 
And so if you really look carefully, for instance, into the quantum mechanics, how do you restrict how do you restrict a particle, you know, to, to R plus instead of R? Well, that's kind of harder than you would expect. Um, you have to choose carefully boundary conditions and so on. And for this positive definite definiteness, so have this positive eigenvalue, well, that's even more difficult. So um and that's one reason why, well, it has been why it has never been achieved a uh, rigorous quantization based on these on these variables. Um, but there's there's a trick, and uh, technically, you know, it, it, this trick you could call it. Uh, it's going to um, the first order or tetrad tetrad variables. But uh, naively, you can say it's it's writing it's writing the matrix as a square of some as a square of something. So um, if you're kind of ensured it, it's positive, right? Because that's your... yeah. If 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 it's a square of something, then it's positive. There's interesting discussion when what happens if it's zero. So it can still have zero eigenvalues, and the, you know there are lots of interesting questions connected to these to these things. Well, um, and so you see that these things are quite subtle. In any case, um, if you do that then the thing you do square that can be in principle positive or negative and so you you have less of this issue of restricting to something which is only positive um, so it's basically instead of quantizing x and x to be positive you decide to write x as y squared and then y can be anything it's easy um, to treat in some sense. Why? It's, it's, okay. Yeah, it's a real answer. It negative. So, um, and this, also this formalism has been known for a long time. I mean, it's kind of uh, Palatini action. So it's using using tetrads and the spin connection. So um, you, you can do that. But then it turns out that still the quantization was difficult using this alone. Um, but if you do a further shift, and this time the shift is not so much on the on the tetrads or on the triads now for for the spatial matrix, um, but on the conjugated variable. Uh, so what you do is basically you take your conjugated variable, so it was extrinsic curvature. So and the one telling us how to glue together. How to embed, yes. you know. Yes. And then it, the non-trivial part is that one can show, and basically that's Abai Ashtika who did it, uh, that if you do add basically uh, the spin connection to this extrinsic curvature, this is a canonical transformation. So that was the non-trivial part to show. Um, and... The important thing is now your conjugated variable is a connection variable, <laughs> meaning the extrinsic curvature, if I can be technical for one second, well, that is a tensor, um, but the connection is not a tensor, it's a connection. Um, and so if you add a connection part, it still does transform as a, as a connection. So there you basically get uh, uh, Ashtika connection, or now it's called Ashtika Barbero music connection. Um, and um, well, you do add it, uh, you do add the thing, but then there's an ambiguity, which is you can write a parameter in, one, in front of one of these terms. Uh, you can a bit choose what you do and then rescale. So, uh, I mean, in, you can choose in which in front of which term but then it doesn't matter because you have to normalize again um and that's a barbero music parameter um but in any case technically you now have a, a theory of a connection so that's um, the important thing right just to hmm? if i may just to if i if i just may jump in for one second hmm. you started from uh, general relativity or from your decomposition mm -hmm. you had this metric 3d metric variables on the slices that need mm -hmm. to be positive and that's complicated because you need to restrict them when you go quantum so you went to the uh to the fear binary or the 
tribe in the formalism on the yeah. on the yeah. on the slices, right? Which can be you need to square them to get the, square them to get the, the mm -hmm. geometry. So that's quite easier when they can be. But this is not enough. Uh, from that point, yeah. the conjugate variable, which are these Ashtekara, Barberi, Mirzi variables, and mm -hmm. the uh, when when I say conjugate, let me just say this for our viewers. Uh, it is more or less the same as position and uh, momentum or velocity mm -hmm. in quantum mechanics. Like momentum tells you how position changes and so on. So these are conjugate mm -hmm. variables. And if you go to the conjugate variables, you find something which is quite useful, namely a connection. And you your result, which is quite surprising, is that your gravity theory is similar to our standard young Mills theories like uh, electrodynamics or chromodynamics, yeah. or electroweak theory, so, whatever. It, in a sense, yeah. they are similar at it's, least at a mathematical it's, level. It, yeah, so that's what we what we usually say. It, it has the same kinematical mm -hmm. variables. Mm -hmm. then, like the expression, the mathematical object you use. Uh, then, as, yeah, then young Mills theory so uh, and and the uh, um and, and the theory of connection so usually a connection can be valued in some group <laughs> um and that would be uh, su2 or the you know the double cover of the rotation group um and well, this su2 is compact and that's where the compactness comes comes in <laughs> um and like the spatial metric information, which are now in these in the in the dry binds or triads, this is conjugated to to these compact very you know now compactified if you will uh, variables, and that's where the discrete spectra come from. So the second step is that we replace the connection by well, technically holonomies, so we integrate, so connections can be naturally integrated um, along one-dimensional lines. And that's what is called uh, uh, a holonomy. So it's these finite parallel transports, how you should, connection tells you how to parallel transport. Um, and so what you get in, in the end is group elements, um, and these are compact valued and so that's in the end that determines that you do that we do get discrete discrete spectra so if you are there you know it's only well then immediately you see okay you, you do get discrete spectra for for your spatial geometric quantities and that includes in four dimensions areas and and volumes well um, so there's another step with respect to what they said before, like from your connection as a variable of your theory, which is, this might sound a bit complicated for, for an audience, but actually what we're just saying uh, is that you write your theory in some way and you rewrite it using different mm -hmm. variables, which make it simpler to be treated mathematically, okay? So instead of using this connection, which is like what we have in a young Mills theory, you take the integral of the connection, oh, the connection. Yeah. yeah over some closed loops uh, and lines and so on yeah. and so forth and those are the new variables they tell you the same information but your theory mm. can be treated more easily in a sense do you agree with this uh, yeah, yeah. again one can kind of contemplate the step but um this choice is also again motivated by um being you know invariant or covariant mm -hmm. um with respect to coordinate transformation or diffeomorphism. So you know, instead of a point, you know, you now consider these holonomies which are defined along lines. Mm -hmm. And so the, the conjugated variables are defined on, on surfaces. Mm -hmm. And so that's very nice because you get a, a kind of topolo you know, a relation that these are conjugated. Two of these things are conjugated only if the line cuts through a surface. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, I mentioned that it's difficult to, to quantize uh, quantum field series with diffeomorphism symmetry, mm -hmm. and that there are no examples now uh, known. It's not correct, actually. The only examples we know um, almost are topological quantum field series. And so this kind of quantization is 
is the same, you know, that was basically developed in, in, in the field of topological quantum field theories. Uh, so it, there you, you use basically the same quantization um, to construct topological quantum field theories. Okay, so this is more or less the kind of uh, line of thought you follow when you're approaching loop quantum gravity, right? So mm -hmm. this is the kind of idea behind loop quantum gravity. And from here, right, from this kind of canonical quantization, your choice of variables along holonomies, like what happens when you go along a line with this quantum geometry and so on and so forth, where do you get, uh, which results do you obtain, and somehow more importantly for uh, the direction in which uh, our discussion might go, how do these spin forms appear, if I can mm -hmm. ask you? Such an abrupt question. You didn't mention spin forms up to now, but uh, that's clearly where <laughs> we are going. So um, yeah, so so far we basically discussed still on on a somewhat kinematical level. So what happens if you try to to approach and canonically quantize uh, your matrix information? Mm -hmm. So if you which then gives you the gravitational field. Um, and well, you know, for we say it for many reasons, it's technically simpler to go to these connections and then holonomies. Um, and then you get these these uh, uh, variables, which on the one hand um, they give you all the geometric information and also lead to this discrete spectra of, of these area operators. Um, and you still have basically the same kinematic in Yang Mills theory and also in quantum gravity, you can now define uh, the dynamics using using a pass integral. Um, and um, in fact, if you would do that for you know let us quant let us Yang Mills theory where you also use holonomies. Mm -hmm. so you can write, you can also your, uh, um, what, what is discrete are your electrical, so-called electrical fluxes, and you can rewrite your pass integral into a sum over basically the spectra of these electrical fluxes. So you get really, you know, a, a sum if you do use SU2, um, then these these discrete spectra are labeled by spin representation. So you could call, could call that a spin sum. Um, if, if I may, if I may, let me please jump in here because mm -hmm. you made a very important distinction which I would highlight between kinematics, namely the description of the kind of objects we have in a physical theory and dynamics, which is something more you put on top of kinematics, namely, mm -hmm the way in this in which these objects behave. So in a sense, what we described before, these connections and then holonomies are our kinematics, right? The kind of degrees of freedom if people mm -hmm. are uh, used to this kind of language we have in our quantum gravity theory. And now we are trying to implement some dynamics, right? On top mm -hmm. of that, like restrict the ways in which they can behave and configure themselves. Mm -hmm. And you're doing this by using a path integral is that, which is a specific way of formulating quantum mechanics. Uh, is this more uh, or less fair? I mean, that's that's one way of doing it, yeah. Um, but the other way would be also to look at the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. but then- the one uh, we mentioned I mean, before, right? The... It, it is a Hamiltonian constraint. Yes. And, and then the kind of issues to kind of write down actually the correct Hamiltonian, which I mean, it's not only one Hamiltonian constraint, there's actually infinitely many co Hamiltonian constraint, constraints, which need to satisfy uh, consistency conditions. And so that's kind of, let's say open questions, <laughs> whether that's all consistent and whether we do know the correct, um, the correct dynamics and that's, uh, it's it's a difficult issue again because well, it's kind of writing down a consistent dynamics which is diffeomorphism invariant. Mm -hmm. 
is 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 highly it's highly non-trivial and it, actually in some sense it requires you to solve the dynamics of the theory first and um, maybe I can give you one heuristic reason why why that is um uh so so in some sense we spoke about that you know space time space time points should not matter and diffeomorphisms can move around space time points and that's and so a in fact, of the theory so it really should and that's the symmetry of the theory and so in fact it's very difficult to write down something you know where you can move space time points you know if you if you then in some sense, this could, I mean, we represent the theory always um, on some on some choice of discrete probes. You can see the step of going to a connection to from a connection to holonomies where you integrate along lines as putting a, a discrete probes because you need to you need to put your set of lines. You know that's what we call a network. Or spin network. So like that's word, if I may, the word probe is used in the in quite a literal sense in this context. Yeah. Like you, literally, what you use to probe the physical properties of your space. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you choose this probe. <laughs> you know, then it looks kind of simple. Oh, I have reduced all my degrees of freedom. You know, from infinite to to only the degrees of freedom which are supported by this probe, which can live on this network, <laughs> and it will be a spin network. But then you know you can move the spin network around. You can make it dense in one region and less dense in another region, just by moving the points around, which are different morphisms. And so writing it, writing something down naively, um, which is consistent or invariant with respect to all these notions, um, so uh, is is very difficult. So in some sense, your dynamics needs to be consistent for all probes at once, and that that's difficult. And in some sense, you know, I well, at least we do, or I think I I do have a a strategy to construct this uh, dynamics. But you know, in constructing that, it's basically by a renormalization construction, what you need to do is to integrate out. So to first solve uh, uh, the dynamics for for some regions to find out what is a, what is what is the correct dynamics. And um, all this is a bit it's easier to do if you really start from a covariant picture. <laughs> where you can kind of easier live with the fact that you might not have the correct dynamics you start with, but you can always go through this process and improve your dynamics via kind of a renormalization process. Since many important objects appeared in your, in your broad answer, uh, may I ask you to, before going, really jumping into this uh, covariant pathing, well, for covariant, mm -hmm integral approach uh, to the to the issue can you spend a few more words in defining what a spin network is because you mentioned it as this kind of probe you have many of them you have to everything to be properly consistent but maybe people listening to us are wondering what spin networks are maybe they've mm -hmm. heard this word this buzzword but they don't really figure picture them in their mind and it might be useful to characterize them yeah yeah so um so we we indeed probe this field along this uh, network of one dimensional lines. Um, Literally a this... network. You can picture it as a network. Yeah. So, um, and and that comes indeed from integrating these connections along holonomies, which you do along lines. Mm -hmm. But to get a kind of non trivial state, you really have to allow also nodes and so on. So, you have to make these lines connect into, into nodes. And so, if you want to have um, an interesting state, you know, which kind of describes you a smooth manifold, you have to indeed imagine that we, we would need a very, very dense, lots of, you know, lots of nodes and lots of lines connecting, connecting these. I mean, again, there's a difficulty, dense doesn't make much sense because that would already assume you know the volume, but uh, if you want to describe something 
bigger with respect to well, the state you would put in at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, well, then you can, uh, in principle, work with, with these holonomies. You know, that is one representation of the state. Um, but you can also go to the conjugated observable, which I mentioned part of this conjugated observables are areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that they are discrete. And so roughly it comes because these holonomies are SU2. Mm -hmm. So the conjugated operators turn out to be angular momentum operators. Um, and their spectrum is determined by what we call spin representations. Uh, so SU2 representations. And so if you go into this representation, it's basically just a Fourier transform and it's just a generalized Fourier transform. Um, well, then you get these discrete labels, uh, which confusingly are called spins, but <laughs> are not the same thing as Ising spins. So <laughs> these are just SU2 representation. And if you do have this network with spins in it, it represents a state in your system, and it's called a spin network. Um, and that should be understood. Yeah, in some sense, as, as a probe of your field. So in a sense, uh, uh, following all the steps we did before, starting from GR, uh, triads, and then connections, and then uh, these holonomies and stuff, you're saying that still within the context of our four-dimensional space-time sliced in these three-dimensional mm -hmm. uh, objects that are glued together along time, let me put some... Uh, Commas around that. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful about space time and so on and so forth, and if your morphism invariance. You somehow represent, can represent your kinematical, still kinematical. Mm -hmm. we, we, we still have to implement the dynamics. Kinematical mm -hmm. degrees of freedom with these spin networks that are networks, mm -hmm. literally networks, freedom constructing your three dimensional space time with nodes and links and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you can either look at them as networks, or you can look at them in the conjugate perspective, which is once more position and momentum. You can choose where to look. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's in which your variables are the areas constructed by this network mm -hmm. in some sense, which get to be discrete uh, due to the presence of this mathematical group, which is SU2, no, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the technical details. But this is more or less the picture you have for your three dimensions. Mm -hmm lies like this network or the areas like the small triangles that <laughs> yeah. with, yeah. this, with these links is this more or less the idea yeah yeah and so these these spin representation give us uh yeah they, they label the eigenvalues for these for these areas and if i may since we are still at a kinematical level how do we perform the jump into the dynamics right how do we implement these path integrals uh, to make these things evolve in time? So so we take this kinematical level and then we go back to the covariant picture in some sense where we work with an action and you do can, you, you can do construct your path integral. And so we we kind of mimic a bit in rewriting all this, making all this co coordinate transformation. We can mimic that for, for the action when we do the same thing on the level of the action. And that allows us to rewrite the path integral also as first as a fun function of these group elements. Mm -hmm. And then as a function, you know, by again doing the same thing, like a Fourier transform, as a function of, of these spin representations. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you, you do start with a, uh, for with a four-dimensional action. Um, again, technically, you know, it's not the standard um, Palatini action. It's technically called the Plebansky action. Um, and we do this construction. Um, are we doing the right thing? Well, one indication is, again, that, that this formulation of GR, the Plebansky action, is well, it's not quite near, but you know, it comes. Uh, you can understand it as the topological quantum field theory, uh, which you change by putting up again something called constraints. Um, but then, on the level of the topological quantum field theory, 
you could call, you could say that they have the same kinematics. And so all these steps you would have also to do with the topological quantum field theory. And then you have to impose these constraints. So all our steps coincide with what you have to do in the topological quantum field theory. And on the topological quantum field theory, well, we can we have lots of checks indeed that what you what you do get out makes sense. And one big chain, one big check, of course, it's the diffeomorphism invariant, is invariant under all kinds of choices in your construction, like your choice of triangulation and so on. And of course, then the difficulty is that you have to impose the constraints and you move away a bit from, from this. But that's kind of um, well, something like an, an anchor you, you ha have as a topological quantum field theory. Um, and uh, well, then you, one does manage to, to arrive at spin form amplitudes, um, which give you this path integral. And so in principle, the, the dynamics of the theory. Um, modulo, <laughs> in particular, in imposing these constraints, you know, you have to do some choices and approximations. So in principle, you have to go through this process of improving your dynamics and restoring the morphism symmetry. But you use the word amplitudes, like in standard quantum mm -hmm. mechanics, you compute uh, with your path integrals, you compute amplitudes, namely probabilities, to mm -hmm. measure something uh, when you know you have measured something else, right? Mm -hmm. And is this more or less the same thing? Namely, you have your four-dimensional object, you slice it, you say, okay, let's say this slice is like this, represented by this specific network. What's the mm -hmm. probability of finding this other network on this other slice? Is mm -hmm. this more or less the idea? And you say, okay, if I if I want to find this, this is the probability. If it's a slightly different network, this other is the probability, and so on and so forth. Is it more or less this the idea? Um, more well, um, so so we call them. I mean, some people call them transition amplitudes, but indeed one should be very careful in the interpretation. <laughs> um, and um, well. It does help to, to go through a simple example. One can like take a free particle and turn it into a system where one has coordinate transformation with respect to, to the time variable. That's called the parameterized particle. And then one can write the path integral also and consider what kind of um, transition, transition amplitudes one, well, what kind of amplitudes one has um, and so I need to kind of remember myself. Um, so, so to really call them transition amplitudes, you know, you have to um, do some additional steps. So, uh, and and interpret them in, in a certain way because the spin network in itself is not really what we would call a physical state. Um, uh, but then. Uh, if you if if you uh, indeed do this path integral, ideally what it should do is to project out all unphysical information. So it's actually uh, supposed to project on 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 something what we call physical. And in fact, well, let's let's just finish this thought. And if you interpret that correctly, it does indeed. Uh, give you an interpretation where you use both like the information both sides of the of the uh, in state and out state to construct some relational information and can interpret that um, as as a transition amplitude with, with respect to kind of some time parameter you have to construct from the variables you use in your representation <laughs> so sometimes you know if you use kind of variables which are not a good time then it might not be good to 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 interpret that as a transition in time. Well, okay, um, it really has to be careful. <laughs> in because in fact, even for the even if you consider the the parameterized particle, you can easily write states which you know um, are smeared out in time. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> but then 
you know, you, 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 you do describe uh, the transition from something smeared out of time to something else to, um, smeared out of time in time. So you can, you, uh, you, you can interpret them, but you have to be careful with the interpretation. Um, but these, uh, the, yeah, the definition is, is I mean, you, you can compute these quantities and they do have a meaning. You have to be careful with the meaning. Um, and the other thing is that indeed, uh, if you have these spin forms, you know, I mentioned ideally they should be a projector. <laughs> a priori, you know, they are not exact projectors and that comes again through these difficulties with diffeomorphic symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this is what, you know, you, I hope to improve via a process called renormalization. And at this level, the idea is quite simple because if you do have something which is almost a projector, mm -hmm. and like, you take pardon like me. pardon me, when you say projector, you're specifically referring to something that excludes non-physical states. We should we do yeah. not in our description and yeah. only also, takes you to physical states in some yeah. sense. Also. Um, a key property of a projector is if you square a projector, you do get a projector. Yes, yes. You you do get the same projector back. And so it's kind of easy to check and and I mean in the case of spin forms, it's not so easy to check, but in principle you can always Relative. try to square yes. to yes. square your your pass integral in principle and and check whether whether you get again the Pass integral. Um, but uh, that is not a priori satisfied if you naively start with whatever, you know, whatever you get out from your quantization procedure. It won't be automatically a projector. Um, but if you also have something which is a projector, you, know, you take arbitrary, they take lots of powers of it. It's like you, you, you apply it recursively. Then you can hope that in the limit, you know, it goes to a fixed point, okay. and the fixed point is p squared equal to p. That okay. is a projector. Okay. And okay. and so this idea, however, is very similar to renormalization group and renormalization group fixed points. So um, you can you can hope to reach that. Okay. So you have something. Your path integral within your spin form approach is something that. You would like to be a projector, but it's not quite. But if you apply it many, 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 many different mm. times, you might end up mm. with a projector. Like this deviation gets might mm -hmm. get smaller and smaller and smaller, and in the end, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Something like along mm -hmm. this thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And given this kind of picture, and we made quite a few steps starting from a general relativistic picture of gravity, right? We we remarked them a few times. We, we ended up with this perhaps uh, uh, properly realized uh, quantum mechanical description of a space and variables that uh, respect some dynamics given by this projector and so on and so forth. One, once you have a quantum theory, a natural expectation is for you to be able to extract in some limit your old uh, dynamics, right? In some mm -hmm. sense, in order to check, uh, I'm saying this for the people listening to us, when you have electrodynamics and you write down quantum electrodynamics, in order to check that that's actually a quantum theory of electrodynamics, you really want to be able to go back in some limit, in some approximation, something like that, mm -hmm. your old electrodynamics. We call this a classical limit. Mm -hmm. And in this sense... Can you perform some classical limits of limit of these models to go back to general relativity and show that they actually give you in some approximation general relativity? And if not, uh, how far are we in this sense and which big problems are still to be solved? Um, uh, so the, the, the short answer is yes. And, and there was progress in particular in the in the in the last years. But of course it well, they come with approximations. So you have to. Um, but in general, indeed we do have well, we do get this pass integral. And um one 
one big issue is to compute this path integral. Um, and that's something general because what we really compute, want to compute is, is the Lorentzian path integral. And I mean the path integral with an I. <laughs> and that's one of the of the big difficulties that many techniques in quantum field theory, um, in particular if it comes to um, non-perturbative non -perturbative lattice young mills, how do you do that? You use Monte Carlo simulations, but only after a weak transformation, after you rotate from you know, your Lorentzian space-time to Euclidean space-time, which turns your um, complex phase into something exponentially decaying. Mm -hmm. um, and Monte Carlo simulations have been such a powerful tool for you know, exploring all these things. And so there are much, 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 much less techniques to do it if you have an eye, you know, you cannot apply any more statistical physics techniques. So what has been difficult is to really take this completely non-perturbative thing and and extract like many body properties from it. You know, I mean the ideal thing would be, or we take this fully non-perturbative, complicated thing and really simulate and sum over all these variables. And it's usually difficult because even for Monte, Monte Carlo simulations, you know, what is simulated on the lattice are only a few cubes uh, or maybe a few thousand. I don't know what you can do. Um, but yeah, I think now they are on a threshold um, to to really be able to maybe even do a nucleus and, and, and QCD. Mm -hmm. So it's already already QCD is so immensely difficult. Even if you can, you know, wick rotate, use this Monte Carlo simulations. And more or less the power of Monte Carlo simulation is that you don't sum over all variables. You only, you know, probe statistically and and uh, hope on the power of statistical theory that the result is right, basically. Um, so uh, figuring out what is really kind of uh, the, the, I mean, doing these fully non-perturbative computations with many, many of the space-time atoms, that remains a challenge. Um, on, on the other hand, what, what lots of work has been done is considering a small, a small amount or even just one one basic building block um, and to take what is known as what was described as semi-classical limit there. Mm -hmm. um, this turned out to be quite confusing. <laughs> uh, one reason is because what what uh, what turned out to be um, well, what we usually describe as semi-classical limit is to send h bar to zero. In itself, this doesn't make any sense because h bar is h bar. So what we usually mean is that we send some other variable to zero so that the action becomes large as compared to h bar. And, and h bar becomes negligible. Yes, controlling and, properties and yeah. so on, it becomes more or less zero, yes. And um, in the case of, of spin forms, this quantity are actually the spins. So it's actually the size of the building block. So um, in some sense, well, you have to sense the size to be large. Also that goes against doing kind of renormalization because you want to have many building blocks which are small, you know, which are smaller than, okay. And then the slightly confusing results which came out of that is that, oh, the semi-classical limit looks a bit peculiar because it seems to suppress curvature. But this came out of a particular interesting thing, I would say, um, because of the step where we kind of go to use connection and then we say that we use areas and areas that are discrete. Mm -hmm. So um, in some sense, this does introduce a quantization anomaly. So it's it's something, you know, that something unusual happens, which does not happen classically, um, which forces us to do something else. And 
uh, this anomaly, interestingly, is indeed that if you do have areas um, and and uh, they have discrete spectra, and then I mentioned that in spin forms, oh, we want to impose these constraints. The anomaly basically does not, I mean, it's basically that if we do impose these constraints on the areas with the discrete variables, if we do want to do that exactly, it's not really possible. And so the reason is that these constraint equations turn into Diophantine equations. So it's kind of polynomial equations where you look only for answers uh, for, for, for solutions um, with integers. Mm -hmm. And so you have only very few solutions. Mm -hmm. So you would only find very few states which would satisfy these things. So what you have to do is to slightly loosen up these constraints. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is that it turns out if you loosen them up, you really properly go uh, to, in some sense, a, 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 a larger configuration space than your length matrix. Okay. Um, in some sense, you go to area matrix. And so areas are you know, it's areas that are more fundamental than lengths. And this, and this you said your areas being uh, conjugate to links and then being discrete, yeah. right? So, so the you, you you have these areas and with working with areas, if you just consider areas, it does define you a kind of a larger configuration space. You can construct more general objects from them than from length matrix. So there's, you know, there's a subset of the area configurations which do define you, which allow a consistent length mm -hmm. association, but not all of them do. So you have um, no configure. You have all the ones you previously had plus some others. Yeah. Okay. And and um, this enlargement, you know, how how often your configuration are allowed to fluctuate into this enlargement. That's interestingly parameterized by this Barbero Miesi parameter. Okay. Okay. Which is so the one you actually... introduce when extending the action you had this yeah. freedom of introducing yeah. a new parameter. So so this, you know, if this parameter has actually an interpretation, and that's to which extent you allow these fluctuations to happen. And you can say it's a it's a true quantum effect, you know, so you kind of enlarge that. Um, and you can be quite happy about it because like there's parallel developments where, you know, like in holography, all these geometric quantities, which are uh, considered in holography are also in four dimensions are based on areas. So, um, and so areas appear very naturally as in four dimensions as, as uh, more natural variables. But then, indeed, you have these issues in constructing a dynamics based on areas and not anymore on lengths. In any case, this and this this effect what what seemed to be confusing was caused by this enlargement. So it was an anomaly issue. But then, you know, one resolution indeed of 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 this puzzle was that the correct semi-classical limit should be not only that h bar is small or you know the, the spin representation is large, but also that this Barbero Emisi parameter, which is an anomaly parameter, it needs to be small. Um, so you had to um, specify uh, well specify further what is meant by the semi-classical limit. And so still, it turned out that doing these simulations with the full complicated original models was was very hard. But then um, a few years back, uh, some friends, uh, well, this Hal Haggard, Cesar Center, and myself kind of invented what we called effective spin for models. And effective because, first of all, they were much easier to compute. Um, but also we took kind of the, what we, the key essentials of spin forms and really understood the issues much clearer <laughs> um, in, in, a very, in a quite a short time. And so we could actually compute really 
um, for you know a, a number of mill building blocks the pass integral and we could compute expectation values and test really the equations of motion so so there we found how oh, we do get the correct equations of motion um, of in this case, discretized general relativity, um, if we choose this Barbero and music parameter sufficiently small. And sufficiently small depended a bit on, you know, on the curvature you impose here, but it was around 0 0.1, which kind of is consistent with pe what people think should be the yeah, parameter. That would have been my follow-up and perhaps uh, second to last question, right? Because I know that the Barbero Mirzi parameter also appears in a variety of distinct results in within loop quantum gravity. For instance, in the computation of the black hole uh, entropy, right? This is mm -hmm. yes. The, uh, is it more or less consistent of what people expect from this uh, entropy slash thermodynamics? Uh, yeah, yeah. Black holes? It it is consistent. Um, so so this value is consistent. Also, we still have you know, did this calculation on the discrete level. So for me, it was kind of very important to know what happens if I if I take many, many degrees of freedom, you know, do these anomaly problems add up? Do they get worse or, or, or not? And so um, doing some further approximations, which focused on this issue of having area variables, you know, indeed, it's a question, these degrees of freedom, which you have in addition to the length metric, how do they behave? How do they propagate? Mm -hmm. And um, with doing this further approximation, that allowed me to, to use an infinite lattice and really do the okay. continuum limit. Okay. And then it turned out that in some sense, you know, the theory which we thought would not lead to GR leads to GR. So even a simpler theory we defined a long time ago, it's known as barrett crane model, can lead to GR. Um, so the the physical reason is that uh, we enlarge this we enlarge this um, configuration space and got additional degrees of freedom. But then it turns out that all these additional degrees of freedom are automatically very massive. Okay. So they don't they don't disturb very much the propagation of you know the gravitons in the end. So they can be and neglected so, in this classical continuum limit. Yeah, and and so um, at least on this approximate level, you know, was kind of linearizing the action and so on. We did find, or we get GR, we get a correction, okay. and this correction we could even compute which comes from having these very massive degrees of freedom. So they are kind of suppressed by Planck scale. And this correction is, is a, uh, on the level of the length matrix is a wild square term. Ah, okay. So it's it's a very, you know, and, and the, well, technically you can even motivate why is it wild squared and not Riemann squared and so on. And so that's a very nice result. And then we can actually even write a continuum action which is based on area matrix, which reproduces this result. So I would say that you know these these results at least they resolve many questions we had about the semi-classical limit since two thousand nine, two thousand ten. This when the so-called new models came came around, and even now have basically. Um, one effect which you can say should come from spin forms and that is basically coming from considering a larger configuration space and not on not any more length matrix but but area matrix um you know, which has this funny analogy to 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 strings if you want because you know strings you you go from point particles to strings yes. to strings you know, you go one dimension higher. So here we also say we go from length to areas. So wow. um, <laughs> you you, uh, you probe not on not anymore on length, but on these on these on these surfaces. Um, As you said, kinda 
uh, reminds what you get within holography, in which you have, you know, oh. Uta Kayanagi formula and all these things that give you areas as uh, relating them to correlators on the boundary. So this is quite interesting, honestly. Yes. So if you if you accept all these approximations made, mm -hmm. you know, then indeed we found the result saying we do expect GR to come out. But uh, there should be also an, um, a correction to the dynamics, which is Planck suppressed, mm -hmm. and which in an effective action would be put into a wild square term. And as a just a very brief uh, closing question on the physics part of our interview, and then we'll go into the conclusion. Uh, how big is this correction? You said it's Planck suppressed, so it's small. But is it something you might expect to measure in the in the future, or is it so small we cannot expect to see a deviation in our measurements like that at the observational level? Well, it's a it's a good question because we are kind of uh, trying to explore what is the phenomenology of 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 these things. So we are trying to find effects, um, and indeed it's very small. But um, there have been works before uh, where. It was proposed, you know, for mm -hmm. more abstract reasons that oh, we should rather use an area matrix than, than the length matrix, um, and try to derive uh, effects from that. Um, so one one thing which you, one can possibly quite easily do is is um, couple electromagnetism to the theory. Okay. Because electromagnetism, in some sense, only sees the area matrix. Uh, it does. It does not need. It does not need the length matrix. It only sees the area matrix. Actually, if if you really look, it's because uh, um, it's because the the action is f minu f minu, and that's anti-symmetric. And so you what you get uh, there is basically uh, the area matrix expressed in terms of the length matrix, and then you can just use a more general area matrix. And so the people have been discussing before effects which you which you get by working with a more general area matrix than the area matrix which are defined directly from a length matrix, and so that includes kind of bias fringing and these things. Mm -hmm. And so possibly you know if you go really to very if you if you speak about cosmological observations uh, you know like this probed over long distances. You might hope for something now. That would have been the natural guess, right? Uh, in lens yeah. or stuff like that, or all the photons being emitted uh, in the early universe or stuff like that. I mean, one should not repress hope in this sense. Finding evidence for quantum gravity is nonetheless hard, regardless of yeah. your approach. So that is extremely interesting. Thank you very much for your explanation. That was, I think you mentioned a variety of uh, super interesting topics and I want to really thank you again for your time. Before closing our interview, uh, I, if you allow me, I take a chance to ask you a slightly, slightly more personal question, namely, mm -hmm. why physics in the first place? Why quantum gravity in the first place? But you kind of said that at the beginning, so even more broadly, why are you interested in this kind of topics? This is a question that might sound weird, but I think it's quite interesting and helpful for all the students listening to us now. Uh, why physics? <laughs> why quantum gravity? Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, you know, I guess uh, growing up, um, I was always generally interested in science, uh, also in history, but then uh, I well, one one kind of con I converted from well, something possibly like chemistry. Then I saw like I had chemistry at school. I actually chose chemistry at school, but then the interesting questions seem to be always physics. You know, I could discuss atoms and so on, but then everything was grounded in physics. Um, and then I decided to start to study physics as kind of, oh, yeah, this would, would answer the more interesting, the questions which were of interest to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
kind of going also more and more fundamental in physics. I think one natural point to end up is, is quantum gravity. Um, now, again, I was lucky and possibly lots of things in my way had something to do with me being in Potsdam. So I studied at the University of Potsdam and the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics was at that point in, in Potsdam. And so we naturally could do my, I, I did my diploma thesis with Renate Loy, which was my first introduction to the, to quantum gravity. And, um, so that was very nice. Uh, and uh, not needing to move around, uh, <laughs> at least for this first step. Well, then I started to move around. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing your experience. I really think this can be helpful for students. And uh, once more, thank you for even also everything else, right? For this almost an hour and a half of uh, interesting discussion and interview. And uh, I hope you had a good time here and to see thank you again. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks.